Right. Well, news just in, uh, Dr. Echo Spiogabra, well, Mr. Echo Spiogabra is currently launching his campaign somewhere in Osu, and we're able to take you right there, right now, to find out uh, what he has to say. Consider an injection of some of the DNA, the ideological DNA of our first president, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. This went into my bloodstream and into my mind stream. Subjects such as nationalism, patriotism, ethics, civic responsibility, pan-Africanism, the non-alignment movement, and Ghana's role in world affairs were some of the concepts that we imbibed at a rather early age. In my latter years, as a younger man, I became also a sympathizer of the then fairly radical changes that were taking place under the leadership of ex-president Rawlings, whose fundamental principles of probity, integrity, accountability, and transparency eventually attracted me into Ghana's public service and into what we call politics. And this I did, as you may know, from the guaranteed comforts of a potentially long and well-compensated life in international organizations. Those principles of the revolutionary era of the 1980s have since become the bedrock upon which the NDC party has evolved and continues to be guided today through the ideology of social democracy. But there is a general view held by many political observers that over the last 10 years or so, the NDC seems to have strayed significantly from those core values espoused by President Rawlings. And many NDC members have actually become enchanted with some of the aspects of the culture of our leading opponents, the MPP. For example, the monetization of politics, especially under the Kufour era, has transformed Ghana's political practices to what some consider a very scary extent. Recently, many of us in Ghana were somewhat amazed, may have looked on helplessly, as some candidates for national office in the NPP party displayed what seemed to be open and wanton, exorbitant vote buying. We read about people buying buses for 275 constituencies. We also read about others wrapping large bundles of cash for distribution to their nearly 9,000 delegates. By some accounts, some delegates from the MPP National Delegates Conference went away, in fact, almost all of them, with amounts ranging from between 5,000 to 10,000 cities from a single day's activity. And actually, it's therefore no wonder that I heard that recently when some uh, students that were just about to graduate from one of our leading universities were subjected to an interview to find out what their career plans were, what kind of occupations they intended to <coughs> pursue after leaving university. Some cited a new occupation called political party delegates. <laughs> That's what they were aspiring to become. So while the NPP have unabashedly promoted their love for what they call property ownership, they have also at the same time sought to weaken the NBC's public appeal by carving out a number of populist slogans and social intervention initiatives aimed at cutting off some of the NBC's natural political base from the grassroots and from what we used to call the Lumpen proletariat, by seeming to respond to the national malaise of poverty and unemployment through such initiatives as, initiatives as a school feeding program or expanding the national health insurance program that was actually begun under the, the Rawlings regime, and now the well-known free senior high school program. The otherwise rather elitist NPP party has done a good job, some might say, of eating into the NDC's traditional strongholds. The NPP therefore seems to have been quite successful in some people's view at appealing to those at the bottom of the socioeconomic pyramid and gaining their votes. This happened in 2016, even to the extent of appointing a minister for Zongo Affairs and Inner City Development, when for many, many years, or even decades, it was the NDC that everyone knew had the 
higher appeal within the Zulu community. Meanwhile, although the NBC has done a wonderful job of undertaking a number of showpiece construction and infrastructure projects, like airports, and seaports, flyovers, world-class hospitals, and new universities, some might argue that many of these projects may have benefited or are likely to benefit thousands of middle-class users of airports and well-equipped hospitals, car owners who uses, use our bridges and our roads, rather than maybe the millions of masses of the people whose needs may sometimes be somewhat different. So clearly, more introspection is needed within the NDC to enable us to become more effective in staking out our primary ownership of the agenda for empowering the millions of our population that are caught in the poverty trap and who naturally look to the NDC first for relief. It's when they can't see relief coming from the NDC that some, I believe, may have turned to the MPP. But I think we all now know that even those who turned to the NPP in 2016 are regretting it and want to come back home. Nevertheless, it also seems that many NDC leading lights have also been caught up in the frenzy to imitate or compete with MPP with respect to the love for ostentatious lifestyles and the scramble for individual financial prosperity at the expense of the public good. It is against this backdrop of what seems to be a national malaise, a growing social focus on wealth by any means, a complete drift in national prioritization, the abandonment of the public interest for the personal interest, the rising incidents of corruption in high places, that the Spielberg campaign team has developed a foreign agenda, we call FA in short, to propose an, an alternative narrative for the NDC. The Foil Agenda FA takes its inspiration from Kwame Nkrumah's own famous words when he stated in discussing Ghana's national development and the issues of alignment and non-alignment, and I quote him, that we face neither east nor west, we face forward. forward. Similarly, in the various choices that we need to make as a party, you know, per party in opposition, we need to find our way back to power. The FA mission is therefore not for the NBC to retreat into the dark, decrepit, and depressing defeat of 2016, but for NBC members to look forward with hope and expectancy towards the bright lights of our revival, our regeneration, our restoration, our restitution, and the success that awaits us in 2020. For the FA team, the NBC's future does not include attempting to revive the cadavers and the carcasses of our ignoble squandered defeat of 2016. However, over the past year or so, the FA team has been garnering a passionate and hardworking group of NBC members and other apolitical Ghanaians that are all determined to build an innovative constructive and decisive leadership that will foremost ensure that Ghanaians are lifted out of poverty and can compete with the best and brightest in the world. The Ford Agenda is ultimately not about social class, it's not about educational attainment, it's not about the possession of wealth or the capacity to make loud noises, but about the depth of the Ghanaian nationalistic motivation in our hearts which ought to give us the conviction to continually place the interest of Ghana first and foremost. And admittedly, such inner motivation is not very easy to measure. In discussing my journey to political leadership, I must refer to various opportunities that I had through secondary school to university Achimata School, for that matter, University of Ghana, Commonwealth Hall, and later to the United States and within the Ghanaian communities, both in Ghana and the United States, where I attempted to show various kinds of leadership, whether it was in students' representative council matters, in university student administration, both in Ghana and in Ohio University, 
where I was president of the Foreign Students Association at a certain point. All these, I believe, have prepared me to serve humanity, to serve my nation, and to serve our communities. As you heard from my good friend, Mr. Cassidy, my experiences as a teacher in a classroom, as a farmer where more than 50, sometimes 60% of our population is engaged in the world of marketing and advertising, in the world of global communications, in the world of banking and finance, in selling as an ambassador, diplomacy, working in government, working as an elected officer of our own NDC party, heading church administrations, even becoming a university president, have cumulatively given me a very unusual combination of experiences in many people's view, which ought to make me a good national leader based on the kind of teams that we can establish for us to work together to lead this nation. But for the NDC, it may be that, and some of you have received a, 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 news, a flyer on this, so I will not go into the details, but NDC members in particular are often interested in the contributions that their potential leaders have made to the party. And so if you look at a flyer that has been given to you, you'll see what I've done from 1993, 1994, 1997, 1998, 2000, and on until now with respect to various positions I've held within the party, all of which I believe have given me a very good insight into the challenges facing the party and the kinds of solutions that we should consider for strengthening our party in order for us to win 2020 elections. Again, I believe that newsletter or that leaflet given to you discusses my seven-point agenda for NDC, which include helping to build offices for our constituencies, who, which often meet in rather sorrowful buildings, the importance of creating national and regional business development committees to make our party more entrepreneurially minded and to strengthen the financial base of our party members, the importance of strengthening our youth, especially the men and indeed the women as well, with education, skills, job training, scholarships, and assistance with employment, the need to strengthen especially the women's wing of our party to make it as strong as it used to be when the December 31st women's movement used to be quite dominant in NDC women's affairs, the merits of creating a welfare committee and a welfare fund at the national, regional, and constituency levels to take care of those in our party that sometimes have various difficulties and can't manage it themselves. And of course, the importance of also creating a credit union as a financial institution in which the party itself can lodge its funds and other individuals within the party can also lodge funds to enable the party to have access to low risk and low interest capital to support ourselves and our members. And finally, the importance of a president and indeed a flag bearer having access or providing access to party members who wish from time to time to meet their leader, in which from the evidence of many former leading members of our party was not always the case. Especially as people try to get into the flag flat house and they are stopped by a protocol and national security, etc. So the problems of Ghana, I think, call for very innovative and courageous leadership, and in particular, the importance of networking the knowledge that is contained within Ghana and among Ghanaians in the diaspora. So I've also discussed in a number of other documents, and some of this will be found on our website, www.sriagabra.org, the issues of human capital development and management. How are we going to develop the human capital of Ghana? That's the most important thing. Once your human beings are developed, everything else is possible. Then from there, you get into managing your natural resources, which some people are exploiting and taking out of our country. And we don't even know how much gold and oil leaves our country. The importance of promoting agro-processing, because that's our natural resource, 
and moving into manufacturing and industrialization, the merits of sound financial intervention and financial inclusion, because money is what flows through an economy, the importance of education and the building of the same networks of knowledge, job creation, skills development, and employment, good governance, self-discipline and law and order, and also what one can do with regards to international collaboration and foreign partnerships, because Ghana is only one of more than 100 nations on earth, all of whom are fighting for various access to resources, capital, to markets, and to development. How do we compete in the global economy? Today, Ghana's economy seems to be bleeding almost to hemorrhaging levels, partly due to our excessive borrowing, our budget deficits, our relatively high inflation rates and interest rates, cost of capital, banks collapsing, people getting out of jobs, unemployment high for the youth. Meanwhile, the ordinary person whose savings are being squandered is being made to pay the bill of those bankers and their directors who reportedly may be bailed out of their greed-induced crisis if the law doesn't take its course. Reports of chronic corruption in various spheres of public and private life continues to reach alarming proportions. So there are many reasons why Ghanaians may have to keep voting governments out until the beautiful ones that Aigwe Amman thought about in the 1960s are given a chance to right these wrongs. Unfortunately, I make bold to say that a few beautiful ones have been born, certainly joined the Nkuma era, and some were nurtured into adulthood under the Rollins administration, and some indeed have come of age. And I may be mentioned as one of these who could be given a chance to lead the NDC and Ghana in the right direction. Indeed, this may very well be the last chance for Ghana to be led by anyone who has the combination of what I said was Kwame Nkrumah's DNA. Ecos Piogabra there launching his campaign in Osu, making some bold claims there, including a claim to Kwame Nkrumah's DNA. Well, politically speaking, of course. Uh, and we will be bringing you more from that event in subsequent bulletins.